Theaterinergic antagonists or also known as adrenergic blockers or sympatholytics, are those agents that bind reversibly or irreversibly to adrenergic receptors, but do not trigger the usual receptor-mediated intracellular effects. They are divided to two main groups, the alpha receptors antagonists, and the beta receptors antagonists. And each group is further subdivided to non-selective and selective agents. In this lecture we'll discuss the alpha receptors antagonists. We already know that alpha-1 receptors are located in the blood vessels, when activated by endogenous catecholamines or agonists it produces vasoconstriction, increasing peripheral resistance and blood pressure. So we can conclude that blocking alpha adrenal receptors mainly affects blood pressure, resulting in decreased peripheral vascular resistance, and this induces a reflex tachycardia resulting from the lowered blood pressure. The non-selective alpha adrenal receptors antagonists are, phenoxybenzamine and phentolamine. Phenoxybenzamine binds covalently to both alpha-1 and alpha-2 receptors, so the block is irreversible and non-competitive, and the only way the body can overcome the block is to synthesize new adrenal receptors, and that may require a day or longer. So the actions of phenoxybenzamine last for about 24 hours. After the drug is injected, a delay of a few hours occurs before a blockade develops. On the other hand, phentolamine is a reversible competitive blocker for alpha-1 and alpha-2 receptors, it lasts for approximately 4 hours after a single injection. Both agents block alpha-1 receptors, preventing vasoconstriction of peripheral blood vessels by endogenous catecholamines, so decreasing peripheral resistance, which provokes a reflex tachycardia. They also block presynaptic inhibitory alpha-2 receptors in the heart, resulting in more norepinephrine release, which stimulates beta-1 receptors on the heart increasing cardiac output. And both agents produce what is called, epinephrine reversal, all alpha adrenergic blockers reverse the alpha agonist actions of epinephrine. For example, we already know from the previous lectures that epinephrine acts on alpha-1 receptors in the blood vessels causing vasoconstriction, and also acts on beta-2 in the skeletal muscles blood vessels causing vasodilatation. So by using the non-selective alpha antagonists, the vasoconstrictive action of epinephrine is interrupted, but vasodilation due to beta-2 receptors is not blocked. So in the presence of phenoxybenzamine or phentolamine, the systemic blood pressure decreases in response to epinephrine. And we can conclude that the actions of norepinephrine are not reversed, but are diminished, because norepinephrine has only alpha-1 the suppressor action, and lacks significant beta agonist action on the vasculature and they have no effect on the actions of isoproterenol, which is a pure beta agonist. Phenoxybenzamine is used in the treatment of pheochromocytoma, which is a catechulamin secreting tumor of cells derived from the adrenal medulla. It is sometimes effective in treating Raynaud disease, and frostbite. Phentolamine is used for the short-term management of pheochromocytoma. It is also used locally to prevent dermal necrosis following extravasation of norepinephrine. Phentolamine is also useful to treat hypertensive crisis. Their adverse effects are similar, both cause postural hypotension, and both induce tachycardia that is mediated by the baroreceptor reflex and by blocking the alpha-2 receptors, as we mentioned before. So they should be used with caution in patients with cardiovascular disease and they are not useful in the treatment of hypertension. Phenoxybenzamine can cause nasal stuffiness, nausea, and vomiting. It may also inhibit ejaculation. Let's now talk about the selective blockers for alpha-1 receptors. Prazosin, terazosin, and doxazosin are selective competitive blockers of the alpha-1 receptor, so all of these agents decrease peripheral vascular resistance and lower blood pressure. They cause minimal changes in cardiac output, renal blood flow, and glomerular filtration rate. So we can conclude that they are used in the treatment of hypertension. The first dose of these drugs may produce an exaggerated orthostatic hypotensive response. This action is known as first dose effect, it can be minimized by adjusting the first dose to one-third, 
or one-fourth of the normal dose and by giving the drug at bedtime. Tamsulosin and alfiozosin are other selective alpha-1 antagonists indicated for the treatment of benign prostatic hyperplasia. They are more selective for alpha-1A receptors in the prostate and bladder, so they decrease tone in the smooth muscle of the bladder neck and prostate, improving urine flow with the least effect on blood pressure because it is less selective for alpha-1b receptors found in the blood vessels. Alpha-1 blockers such as brazosin and doxazosin may cause dizziness, a lack of energy, nasal congestion, headache, drowsiness and orthostatic hypotension but lesser than that observed with phenoxybenzamine and phentolamine. They may also cause inhibition of ejaculation and retrograde ejaculation. And the last agent we'll talk about is a selective competitive alpha-2 blocker, it is called yohembine. It is found as a component of the bark of the yohemb tree and has been used as a sexual stimulant and in the treatment of erectile dysfunction. It works at the level of the CNS to increase sympathetic outflow to the periphery. It is contraindicated in cardiovascular disease, psychiatric conditions and renal dysfunction. All of the clinically available beta blockers are competitive antagonists. From our previous knowledge we can conclude how they work and what their actions. We already know that beta-1 receptors are located in the heart, and their activation causes tachycardia and increases cardiac output. Well, their blockade would cause bradycardia and decrease cardiac output, subsequently decrease blood pressure, so of course that would be useful in the treatment of hypertension. In contrast to alpha blockers, they do not induce postural hypotension, because the alpha adrenoceptors remain functional. We also know that beta-2 receptors are located in the skeletal muscles blood vessels, and their activation causes vasodilatation, so their blockade would cause vasoconstriction and increase peripheral resistance. They are also located in the lungs, and their activation causes bronchodilatation, so their blockade would cause bronchoconstriction. Their activation is also responsible for glycogenolysis and glucagon release, so their blockade would inhibit glycogenolysis and glucagon release. So we can conclude from the last two points, that agents that block beta-2 receptors should not be used for patient with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or asthma, and should be used with caution for diabetic patients. There are three main types of beta blockers. The non-selective beta blockers that act at both beta-1 and beta-2 receptors, the cardioselective beta antagonists that primarily block beta-1 receptors, and antagonists with partial agonist activity. Take a notice that their names end in the letters, alol, except for la beta lol and carvedilol. Let's discuss the first type, the non-selective beta blockers that act at both beta-1 and beta-2 receptors, such as propranolol. As we said, by blocking beta-1 receptors in the heart, propranolol diminishes cardiac output, having both negative inotropic and chronotropic effects, so it is used in the treatment of hypertension. In addition, workload and oxygen consumption decrease, and these effects are useful in the treatment of angina pectoris. Propranolol and other beta blockers have a protective effect on the myocardium. So it can be used for myocardial infarction as prophylaxis and treatment and blocking beta-2 mediated vasodilation in skeletal muscles, increase peripheral vascular resistance. In patients with hypertension, total peripheral resistance returns to normal or decreases with long-term use of propranolol. And as expected, blocking beta-2 receptors in the lungs of susceptible patients causes bronchoconstriction. Therefore, beta blockers particularly the non-selective ones, are contraindicated in patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or asthma. As we said, beta blockade leads to decreased glycogenolysis and decreased glucagon secretion. That means, with diabetic patient receiving insulin, propranolol would cause pronounced hypoglycemia after insulin injection. And it also masks the normal physiologic response to hypoglycemia such as tachycardia, tremors and anxiety which is a really dangerous side effect. Propranolol is a lipophilic compound, so it can penetrate the CNS, 
and this allows it to be used prophylactically in reducing migraine episodes. Migraine will be discussed in details in a separate lecture. Propranolol and other beta blockers are effective in diminishing the widespread sympathetic stimulation that occurs in hyperthyroidism, also known as thyrotoxicosis and thyroid storm. Beta blockers may be life saving in protecting against serious cardiac arrhythmias. Its adverse effects include bradycardia and hypotension, heart failure in case of inadequate myocardial function, arrhythmias upon abrupt withdrawal so it should be stopped gradually at a period of at least a few weeks. Bronchoconstriction due to blocking beta-2 receptors in the lungs. Augmenting the hypoglycemic effect of insulin, as we mentioned before. Propranolol has numerous CNS-mediated effects, including depression, fatigue, dizziness and nightmares. And it also causes sexual impairment and cold extremities. The second non-selective beta blocker is not Ololol. It also block beta-1 and beta-2 adrenoceptors and are more potent than propranolol. Nodolol has a very long duration of action. It is available with the brand name, Corgard, and is indicated for the long-term management of angina. The third non-selective beta blocker is a group that is applied topically in the eye for the treatment of chronic open angle glaucoma. They reduce the production of aqueous humor in the eye. Timolol. Betaxolol and cartolol. Note that betaxolol is a selective beta-1 blocker. Unlike the cholinergic drugs such as bilocropine, that we discussed before, these agents neither affect the ability of the eye to focus for near vision nor change pupil size. But in an acute attack of glaucoma, palocropine is still the drug of choice for emergency lowering of intraocular pressure. When these agents administered intraocularly, the onset is about 30 minutes, and the effects last for 12 to 24 hours. Glaucoma will be discussed in a separate lecture. Now let's move to the selective beta-1 blockers. Acebutalol, etinolol, betoxolol, bisoprolol, esmolol, metoprolol, and nebivolol. They are selective beta-1 antagonists, but they still can antagonize beta-2 receptors at high doses. So we can conclude that these agents, in contrast to bupronolol, have fewer effects on pulmonary function, peripheral resistance, and carbohydrate metabolism that were mediated by beta-2 receptors blockade. These drugs lower blood pressure and hypertension and increase exercise tolerance in angina. So they are useful in hypertensive patients with impaired pulmonary function. And they are also first-line therapy for chronic stable angina. Nebivolol has another mechanism to decrease blood pressure, it releases nitric oxide from endothelial cells and causes vasodilation. Remember it by in letter, of nebivolol and of nitric oxide. Esmolol has a very short half-life due to metabolism of an ester linkage. It is only available intravenously and is used to control blood pressure or heart rhythm during surgery or diagnostic procedures. Bisoprolol and the extended release formulation of metoprolol are indicated for the management of chronic heart failure. These agents will be discussed in details in the CVS lectures. Let's move to the agents that have antagonists with partial agonist activity, or also said to have intrinsic sympathomimetic activity. Acebutalol, which is a beta 1 selective blocker, and pendulol, which is a non selective beta blocker, are not pure antagonists. These partial agonists stimulate the beta receptor to which they are bound, and they inhibit stimulation by the more potent endogenous catecholamines such as epinephrine and norepinephrine, leading to diminished effect on cardiac rate and cardiac output compared to that of beta blockers without intrinsic sympathomimetic activity. They are effective in hypertensive patients with moderate bradycardia, because a further decrease in heart rate is less pronounced with these drugs but they can't be used for stable angina or arrhythmias due to their partial agonist effect. And the last part of this lecture will be about the drugs that block both beta and alpha receptors. La beta lol and carvedilol, they are non-selective beta blockers, causing decrease in the cardiac output, and they also have alpha-1 blocking actions, causing vasodilatation and decreasing peripheral vascular resistance, thereby reducing blood pressure. If you remember, 
We said that beta blockers produce initial peripheral vasoconstriction. So abetalol and carvedilol are useful in treating hypertensive patients for whom increased peripheral vascular resistance is undesirable. Intravenous labetalol is also used to treat hypertensive emergencies, because it can rapidly lower blood pressure. Carvedilol as well as metoprolol and bisoprolol are beneficial in patients with stable chronic heart failure. They have some adverse effects such as orthostatic hypotension and dizziness, that are associated with alpha-1 blockade. The adrenergic neuron blockers are those agents that act by inhibition of, the release of catecholamines, such as guanathidine. The storage of catecholamines, such as rizapine. The synthesis of catecholamines such as alpha-methyl dopa. Let's discuss them one by one. Guanathidine is transported across the sympathetic nerve membrane by the same mechanism that transports norepinephrine itself, so in this step it competes with norepinephrine, so it can potentiate exogenously applied norepinephrine. Once guanathidine has entered the nerve, it is concentrated in transmitter vesicles, where it replaces norepinephrine. This leads to a gradual depletion of norepinephrine stores in the nerve endings. Once inside the terminal it blocks the release of norepinephrine in response to arrival of an action potential. So we can conclude that this agent can be used in the treatment of hypertension. Rizapine, inhibits granular uptake and storage of biogenic amines, such as norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin from the cytoplasm into storage vesicles in the adrenergic nerve terminals in all body tissues. And this causes depletion of biogenic amines. So of course the sympathetic function is impaired, because of decreased release of norepinephrine. It has been used for the management of hypertension, but has largely been replaced with newer agents with better side effect profiles, and fewer drug interactions. And the last one, alpha-methyl dopa, acts by inhibition of dopa decarboxylase enzyme, which converts dopa into dopamine. And as we know, dopamine is a precursor for norepinephrine and subsequently epinephrine. This inhibition results in reduced dopaminergic and adrenergic neurotransmission in the peripheral nervous system. It is converted to alpha-methyl norepinephrine by dopamine beta-hydroxylase. Alpha-methyl norepinephrine is an agonist of presynaptic central nervous system, Alpha-2 adrenergic receptors. Activation of these receptors in the brainstem, appears to inhibit sympathetic nervous system output and lower blood pressure. It is used in the treatment of hypertension. And the most important thing you should know about alpha-methyl dopa, is that it is one of the preferred treatments for high blood pressure in pregnancy.